Turumbático. Te lo dije. A ti nada más. Hello and welcome to. Uh, oh, that's, that's right. Yes, let's all clap. Hello and welcome to Artist Talk Show. My name is uh, Jonathan Gruber. Uh, I'm a journalist, I'm a podcaster, I'm a teacher of investigative journalism, and uh, apparently I'm a person who has an opinion about everything, which is one of the reasons why they asked me to present this Sunday show. And it's an honor to be hosting a show with such a, a powerful, such a meaty subject, namely art, photography, and politics. And uh, to my right here in the studio, we have the one and only uh, Rob Hornster. Welcome, Rob. Let's give a little. Thank you. See what we're doing? Yes. Uh, a little bit about uh, you, Rob. Um, your work here at the festival is called The Europeans. Mm -hmm. And uh, you do a lot of long term things like the Sochi Project. Mm -hmm. uh, it's produced with the writer Arnold von Brücken. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this resulted in a successful crowdfunding campaign, multiple publications, uh, many, many exhibitions, including here. And you even won a prize at the, and this is for me as a journalist, very near and dear to my heart, the World Press Photo. Mm -hmm. Well done, sir. And you're also the head of the photography department at the Royal Academy of Art, K A B K in The Hague. For the time being, for yeah. the t Oh, okay. We may get into that if we have time. Okay. That was very intriguing. Uh, but I do have a quick question. Yeah. And this is a question that I think is very relevant because a lot of what I've seen here today is, uh, is sort of on the edge of journalism, sort of on the edge of art. Are you more of an artist or a journalist? What do you think? Where, I don't know actually, where does storytelling belong? Is it more art, more journalism? Well, what I, do you think? Well, I just call myself a photographer. I think that's the most easy for me. Um, but, uh, well, honestly, if I have to apply for an art grant, I'm suddenly an artist. So, and if I apply for a journalism grant, then I'm a journalist. I really don't care. I'm a kind of a chameleon. <laughs> so I just transform into whatever I need, and then I do my own thing. Yeah. I find it difficult, difficult question, but right. it's all related to each other, and I it doesn't matter. I really appreciate end. that kind of flexibility. <laughs> That's useful in this world. Um, I'll try to do that today as well, yeah. With us on Zoom is Mr. Ed Cashy. Hello, Ed. Can you hear us? Oh, excellent, there he is. So let me introduce you as a little, little ripple for Ed. Uh, Ed is an American photojournalist. You've been a member of the prestigious photo agency, and correct me if I say this right, is it Seven or VII? It's seven. seven. Okay. And you're the author of nine books. And here at Breda Photo, you're exhibiting something called the Enigma Room. And I just saw this, actually. I made sure I had a look at this before we uh, did this show today. It's a multimedia presentation using especially coded uh, software. Welcome to the show, Ed. Where are you right now, though? I'm in uh, Nashville, North Carolina, just uh, beginning a new uh, documentary film project. Oh, that's right. And we, we talked this, actually, we, we briefly spoke about this before we went on the air. Apparently, North Carolina has a Nashville. Uh, I was not aware of that. Neither were you, right? You didn't know that either until you got there. That's right. That's right. Okay. Anyway, welcome, uh, welcome, Ed. And then finally, also uh, with us on Zoom is Michal Ivanovsky. Welcome, Michal. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Michal, you have both British and Polish passports, and you've lived and worked in Cardiff, Wales, since 2001. Yes? That's correct. Yes. That's correct. And uh, Michal followed in the footsteps of his, of his grandfather and uncle, and you walked 2,200 kilometers. Well, they walked in 2,200 kilometers in 1945, right? Fleeing from a Russian prisoner of war camp. I believe we call that a gulag, right? Back to their home in Poland. And uh, Michał's work here at Breda Photo is called Polish Go Home. Uh, are you at home right now, Michał? Absolutely. Yeah? Cardiff is yes. definitely home for you? Uh, I think it's, it kind of feels good, but home is much bigger than that. I think um, on, on our earth is home. You know? that's, <laughs> so that's right. I think well, that's actually, we'll, we'll talk a bit about the definition of what home stands for sure. uh, today. How do you say home in Welsh, though? Do you know that? 
Uh, there's a word in Welsh called Sihiraith, which is something similar to German Heimat, which describes uh, a non-place. It, it encompasses nostalgia, belonging, family, everything, and nothing. It's the, that's the word for here, for, for home here. Hiraith. Hiraith. It's beautiful. Yeah, Hiraith. That's, that's mm -hmm. amazing. You actually are at home in Wales. Because, you know, I was going to surprise you. I actually put it on this card. I wrote down the word, but I had no idea. It, it, that word, but I had no idea how to say it, but you even could say it right. Yes, so yeah, that's I speak Welsh, a little bit. Hiraith. So, yeah. Did I say it right? Hiraith. Yes, you did, yes. Okay, well, welcome to the show. Thank you so, so much. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Um, and let's start with you, Rob. Now, uh, you've got one of the biggest uh, exhibits I've ever seen. And uh, you can actually see it on the screen behind you. It's, uh, it's called The Europeans. It's a whole series of posters and photos hanging in the windows of private homes all over town, all over Breda. That's the reason why it's so big. Each photo, as you can see, as you can see, has a QR code with more information about this particular European on uh, the photo. And if we could just so show the one that I that really jumped out to me is the name is Vidas, or Vida. She's the older gentleman with these incredibly there he is. Look at those eyes. Um, they're haunting, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, can 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 I say? that when I looked at the, uh, the series of photographs that you produced, that uh, in most of these pictures, not all of them, but in most of these pictures, there was something of a bit of sadness hanging about these people. I often hear that, yeah. I often hear that. Yeah. I think it's, uh, yeah, of, of course, this is a way of uh, portraying people. Um, the difference is, of course, between uh, uh, many people, many selfies that you see, uh, where people are smiling, laughing. I always wait until there is kind of calmness. Um, now I work, dig work digital, but before I worked on a large format camera, meaning that you have to time to set up all stuff, etc. It takes a lot of time. So pe people also get bored in front of your cam camera, and that's the moment usually when I take the picture. Um, wait, wait, what? You mean you wait for them to get bored and then you take the picture? Well, I'm setting up my camera and they get bored so it takes minutes at least to set up a large format and now i pretend that i'm setting up all kind of stuff so they still get bored uh, and that's often a moment wait, that wait why do you do that what's the what's the method behind this madness um well you can question of course uh uh, uh, uh the, my method in a way that i try to find a kind of neutral uh emotion uh, as if you are staring at a television and you're face becomes what it is actually uh, whereas photographers the majority of photographers and especially nowadays with social media people are used of course to transform their face into what they want to see so you're smiling or whatsoever and I try to go back to what the face actually is uh, but but I'm also aware that uh, um, some people consider that as uh, uh, more sad or uh, uh, this emotion uh, that's also, of course, that explains completely why I uh, failed as a commercial photography <laughs> photographer. Uh, because whatever assignment I do, people are disappointed. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that's part of my way of working. Oh, uh, that's, but, yeah. that's really funny. This uh, commercial is great, Rob, but why does this person look like they want to kill themselves? Yeah, well, no. We're, we're trying to sell <laughs> soap. You know? is yeah, well, <laughs> it's in a way funny because uh, many people, uh, uh, also people working in advertisement, they, they say, they like my pictures, pictures like this, uh, because of the lighting, because of the all kind of things. So it looks a, a bit commercial and they are attracted. And then they invite me to uh, work on a pitch together with five other photographers. And at the end, they always tell me like, no, we're not going to work with you because then uh, our brand doesn't sell anymore. So <laughs> I don't do these kind of things anymore. I'm not, because I know the answer already at the end. Right, okay. And when they click on the QR code, what do people see? Uh, they get a background story, either written or they get a film or uh, or something else, whatever we can give them. And it's all about Europeans in general in a project that just started, because we just started. Uh, that's important to realize as well. But we continue, and this way of presenting is, of course, it fits very much us, because we like to present uh, work, uh, uh, particularly not in museums, okay, if it's there, that's fine. But I think the majority of people walk outside in the open air, and that's where, yeah, that's our space, so to say. And normally, speaking of space, the exhibition was supposed to be indoors, but because of COVID-19 restrictions, it, it actually ended up being 
presented outdoors, out mm-hmm. in people's homes. How do you feel about the way it worked out? Uh, I'm, uh, uh, we also have to talk about it, Reinhold, but uh, how did it work out? I think actually that the poster campaign worked out really well, but that we also tried to transform the poster campaign back into the uh, institutions, in, in, in billboards, those kind of things, but back into the institution. For me, that doesn't work. It's a poster campaign. It should be out in the public space, behind windows. That's how we invented it. And to try to bring it back, that's like... we, we Yeah, that's... That, but that's the way we learn because we always want to do things differently try to reach a larger audience instead of this yeah let's say quite small audiences inside museums it's beautiful to present over there and it's also i mean beautiful things are being presented over there but if you try to reach to a larger audience then i think it's also wise to sometimes step out of this bubble i mean i've seen now and that's not specifically criticism on this but some topics are very very popular in photography or in art for example to talk about the uh, the the, the uh, lgbtq and the rest yeah. of the letters plus uh, uh, communities and you always see it in the art institutions isn't it you see these kind of these things presented here inside the institutions but who are the ones who are visiting these institutions those are all like-minded people those are all open people so if you want to say something about these communities go out to the people where you can actually make a change instead of always presenting it inside these bubbles where you only find like-minded people this is this is you know part of the larger discussion oh look at them the gentleman our guests are especially ed is like he's just he was applauding you um it it is there it is part of a larger discussion is who goes to see exhibitions is a is it for a particular elite is it for a particular class of people that's a discussion for another day okay i'm going to leave that here because it's so big it could you could do a whole show over it obviously absolutely um but but what i would like to ask you is um when i when i look at these images i get a sense that you're trying to present uh some kind of an idea about what a european is Mm-hmm. So my question is, is this about European identity? Am I on the right track in thinking that? Yes. Because the pictures are all over the place. I mean, it's pictures of all different backgrounds, mm-hmm. uh, walks of life. But so, so how does that speak to the idea of identity? Yes, I think you're right. I think this is about uh, Europe and comes. European identity. Um, and I think actually that there are many... Um, uh, how do you say this? There are many uh, things that connect us Europeans, also between the Netherlands and Greece and uh, uh, and Poland and Spain and England. Uh, but we focus mainly on the differences. And although we always try to say that we don't have a political uh, agenda, uh, we very strongly believe in Europe, in the continent Europe, as a kind of uh, coherent uh, uh, geographical area. And I mean, I specifically focus on the continent because we're not focusing only on the EU, we're focusing on Europe as a All as of a Europe. Part. Yeah, All yeah, of yeah Europe. definitely. Also the edges. Yeah, yeah, because the EU will also change. That's what we see already, right. like England is now going out, and uh, but that will happen most likely, according to us, uh, with more countries in, uh, in the next decade, because we're working on this project for a decade, so it's quite... Uh, but but I think many things will change within these ten years in Europe. And well, for you us know what? That that actually answers my my question because and and I really wanted to bring this in here, but you're actually getting to it, which is you know I'm an American and when I first moved here thirty years ago in the '90s, the European project was a, 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 a large group of disparate cultures, different peoples who spoke different languages and had different histories, all trying to move closer and closer together and trying to see what they had in common. Now what I see, of course, is people looking for things that set them apart from one mm-hmm. another in Europe. It's actually, it's actually quite sad. And, and, and is this, this sounds like this is also what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then there is, of course, in the background, there is also we photographers uh, uh, I'm trying to capture now Europe as, a, uh, I think, as a geographical area, and we try to capture the identity of Europeans and Europe in general, and we try to create a time document, time piece that's valuable for after 100 years, for example. Um, but you, as an American, or ex-American, don't know if you, if you still have an American passport. A little bit of both, also neither. 
I, I, yeah. or if you want to get rid of that passport, <laughs> that's not what I know. But um, uh, in general, uh, Americans are very good in documenting America. And what you do is documenting America as a nation, no matter whether it's Texas, New York, whatsoever. You have so many road trips, road trips I think, invented in America. So there are men, so many people, photographers, artists, whatever, who documented America as a nation. But we have hardly photographers or artists who are documenting Europe as a kind of nation, as it is. And, and that's something we find in particular strange, because they're focusing on problems, like refugee problems in Europe, but that's only one small topic. Try to, docu try to zoom out and document what this nation or this continent actually is. That's what we try to do. And uh, I think it's time to do that because it, there's so many interesting years to come now for Europe that yeah. this is the moment to do it as well. Yeah, um, yeah, I, th I think you're probably right. Okay, okay. everybody, let's uh, Rob this Rob Huishta. We're gonna. Okay. I mean, you're not going away. He's not no. going away. <laughs> Like He's going to stay. We're going to come back to Rob in just a few minutes. But um, what I would like to do is move on to one of our Zoom guests, Ed Kashi. Um, Ed, even though we've got Michal here, is it large? Are we focusing on Michal first? No? Okay. Anyway, God, no, Michal. I like the cap you have on your head, though. Can we acknowledge its existence? It's very nice. Uh, but actually, our, uh, my first question is actually for Ed. I just want to make double sure that he's here. Is Ed still online? I'm here. Okay, good, excellent, very good. So Ed, um, your work is often journalistic, uh, like your series Raising, uh, Rising to the Call, which is in its own way a kind of a road trip of uh, straightforward reportage of Americans living with the corona crisis. At least that's what it seems like it was for me. And if we could just see some pictures, there you go. Just like Rob said, very Americans are very good at documenting American life and that is speaks volumes, this particular picture. What, what are we seeing here, Ed, just very briefly? You want to describe this? Yeah, and I'd like to just clarify. So this project, uh, Rising to the Call, was my response to the pandemic when I arrived uh, for my last trip uh, abroad in February and then was shut down with the quarantine and then realized that, um, you know, how could I respond to this with these limitations? So I decided to focus on the state of New Jersey where I live and just look at um, how people were volunteering and how organizations were pivoting to address this moment. And so this was an unusual case for me where I was really trying to look for the positive aspects of what is otherwise a really you know, tragic and, and very difficult uh, time. And then working hyper-locally, which is something I normally don't do. I've done some of it, but generally, you know, I'm on the road eight months out of the year. So, so that was the spirit and the purpose of this is, this was my way to stay engaged. And so that first picture was just of an elderly Indian man uh, just in the town over from where I live being taken away by uh, emergency service volunteers. So, so what I did was, I did research. We, I worked on this for a couple of months actually, where uh, my, my, my studio manager, Brenda Bingham and I, we're, we're just trying to figure out what are examples of how people in New Jersey or organizations are rising to this moment to come together to volunteer. America has a tremendous tradition of volunteerism, actually. It's a very beautiful thing that I've witnessed all over the country. But anyway, but I focused in this case just on the state of New Jersey. Right. And, and um, then, let's just uh, move on to what you are exhibiting here uh, in Breda. And it's called, and I had a look at it, this morning, it's extraordinary. It's called the Enigma Room, and it tells its story in a much more abstract way. Let's have a look at a film. Which is going to start any second. The second we push the right button, oh, okay. the film is going to start, and it will be worth the wait. Trust me. So. I'm going to talk about it while we, I'm, uh, well, I still have you on here, Ed. The, yeah. this, is, this is the thing that people are going to see. They're going to see um, a triptych, right? Three screens, and also three projectors. And in each one of them, you have, in, in contrast to straightforward photography, which is what I saw when I was researching you, this was far more abstract, right? It was a lot of extraordinary images. Uh, very often video, moving images, and oh, you can see the triptych right over here on the screen, right? 
very often moving images. And um, actually, there was a bit of a technical marvel going on because when I initially sat down, it's a very dark room, and the number of people sit down, they're all quiet, we're all looking at the screen, and I saw that the three screens were showing three separate images, and then at certain points in time, all the images would become one larger image, and I just wondered how you technically did that. Yeah, so this piece is, in a sense, diametrically opposed to the, what, what we initially were talking about, which is, uh, you know, I hate the term straightforward, but a documentary approach to you know, looking at something that is happening in real time with real people. Whereas this piece that's being exhibited at Breda is really about kind of like just trying to do the exact opposite of what I normally do, which is issue oriented, trying to document reality, whatever that means. And in this case, with the use of coding and Michael Curry, who has been working on and off with me for 15 years is really the genius behind this. Uh, and, and Brenda Bingham and Rachel Dennis also contributed to um, not only the visual curation, but also the soundtrack. I was about to mention the sound is extraordinary. It really contributes yeah. to the overall feeling. There is a certain beauty and ominousness uh, at the same time in watching it. You never know what's coming. I sat there for 20 minutes. I never saw the same image, so it wasn't even looping or something. It's just really, really long. How long is it in total? Could you just let me in on the secret? Yeah, this one's, I think, about 14 minutes. This is Enigma 2.0, because last year at Photoville in Brooklyn, we, we premiered it and, it, and this is a slightly different version where we're continuing to play and, and uh, update it, if you like, and, I'm, and this will not be the last iteration of it. But really, this is, um, and I've done a couple of books that are similar to this, where I'm basically trying to break out of the constraints of photojournalism and documentary photography. While I love doing that and I hope to do it till the day I die because it has such value and importance, I, I occasionally love to try to break out of those shackles, if you like, and really, um, in a sense, decontextualize my work to create something totally new. And in this case with the Enigma Room, it's really about um, creating like a mood and, and a, a feeling, in some cases, you know, I want you to feel uneasy and then bring you to a mo you know, moments of tranquility. And the other thing was that it really slows down time, especially in the period we're living through where it feels like time is one like quick scroll and occasionally we stop for a second. And this is about stop, slow down, breathe, allow this to wash over you and, and come into you and who knows where it will take you. Well, that, that certainly answers my, my question, which is what was the takeaway for this kind of thing? But clearly you've, you've, you've said that this is a moment. You, want, you basically want people to have a moment uh, in a like life a where people cool. don't have moments yeah. anymore, right? It's just go, 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 go. Yeah. A, a big yeah. question, of course, is that you have, a, you have a large archive. You've been at this for a long time. You have a large archive to choose from. How did you select the photos that you wanted to go in here? Or how did you select the videos that you wanted to go in there? Yeah, so again, this is, you know, Brenda and, and Rachel and Mike. I, I feel like I, I provided the, the raw, the iron ore, and they created the, the sculpture, if you like, because it's important that they get Who are these credit. people? Why aren't I talking to them? It's true. I'm just an <laughs> imposter. <laughs> but, um, but no, but the point of this is beautiful collaboration, because there are some artists and creative people who can do everything on their own, but so often... This is about collaboration, and, uh, and, that, and for me, that's a beautiful thing. But what we did was, this, this initially started as a book idea, where I wanted, to, I wanted us to go through my archive and look for connections within my work of stills. And then at some point, oh, that's it, we went to the Whitney Museum in New York, and we watched some video installations. We did like a studio field trip, and we left and we were going, this is what we want to do. Like, forget a book. Let's focus on a kind of video, experimental video installation, whatever you want to call it, one that would be immersive. That's why we want it in an absolutely dark room where you can just get lost in it. And then we figured, okay, well, how, you know, like with any project that you create, you do have to create a certain dogma or set of rules, if you like, um, you know, similar to what Rob was talking about with his project, where, you know, you, you, you need to create some contours so that you can create. A, and express within that. Anyway, so we, we figured, oh, we'll try, we'll, we'll work, we'll start with the elements, you know, fire, water, um, 
and we included humanity, earth, air. And then we went through my archive, creating these like five sort of buckets of images and video clips. And then as we got into it and we put it together, it kind of morphed into something beyond just the elements. And, uh, and, and then really you threw Java, you threw Java code on top of this in order to sort of warp the images. And, yeah, and like so that's the kind of thing we're seeing here on the screen right now. You can see this right in the center screen. You have this, uh, what looks like a, just a very interestingly lighted picture of a, of a girl sitting at a desk. And then over to the right, out, what was outside the window is the, the, the colorization has been pulled apart there. Is that the Java code doing that? Yes, and so, so what we would do is we, we create these sequences, if you like, with stills and or video, and then we would t talk with Mike and say, okay, what, how do we want to treat this section, you know? And then we came up with what I call the, the, uh, the Enigma engine, uh, where <laughs> Mike came up with five or six moves, if you like, um, treatments, let's say, or effects, if you like. And then we would figure out, well, what, what effect should we apply to this section? And in some cases, we did nothing to alter the images. And also just on a, I don't know if it's philosophical, but on, a, on, a, on this other level, I wanted, th this project is about like playing with imagery through computer coding, because the reality is once, you know, Instagram came about and it's these digital cameras, and then of course the smartphones, photography is, is, is a digital uh, uh, medium now. Even if you shoot with a pinhole camera on film, you will digitize it at some point to bring it out into the world, unless you were to print it directly for a museum or gallery show. So, so I was thinking, well, if, and I'm always thinking about like, how, where are we going? How can I try things that are new or that pushes at least myself um, and my boundaries? Um, and so we thought, well, computer coding it really is about what photography is now. Photography is coding. Even if you do nothing to it, you're still working with coding. Because you're and using a digital camera, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And so, so that was the idea of uh, one of one of the aspects of this project on a more, I guess, conceptual level. Well, it is it is fascinating and uh, immersive and very successful. I have to say, okay. I really sat there for a good twenty minutes. Frankly, I was just trying to think, think to myself, when's it going to loop? When's it going to loop? I want to see the start. But it just never happened. Anyway, thank you very, very much, Ed. And let's, uh, let's now bring in our, uh, our, our other guest via Zoom, uh, Mr. Michal Ivanovsky. Michal, hello. Welcome, Michal. Yes. So, Michal, you're Polish. As we discussed, you live in Cardiff, Wales. Let's talk about your, your work. It's called Polish Go Home. Uh, how did it start? Um, before we do that, we have a video. Let's see if that video is going to work. Do we have Polish Go Home? Is that going to work? Is it happening? That's a picture. Oh, there we go. years now you know it's the most comfortable feeling when you're walking around you feel like you own the place it's my turf you know <laughs> nobody gives a shit about what I do and who I hang out with that was quite a revelation for me at that time and maybe that's why I've grown so fond of the Welsh and of my life in, in, in Wales my bedroom my study shoe collection Walk in circles. <laughs> I was walking with my buddy 
uh, Jarek taking some photographs and then we saw this and we both felt uncomfortable but we wouldn't say it. And it's a big thing to question your whole existence within a community because somebody writes small black letters on, on a wall, three words, you know. Wow, that's really very affecting. Go home Polish. I, I see a number of things uh, from this uh, video fragment. Uh, you're still wearing the same hat, which I oh, yeah. greatly appreciate. And you had that lovely Practica camera, which is from uh, the early days, from the, when the Iron Curtain still existed. I guess you got that yes. in Poland? Yes, I did. And brought it with you, yeah? So it's, this is essentially, we were talking about road movies. This is, in its own way, a road movie. How did it get started? With this, uh, with this graffiti, actually. I saw it in 2008, and uh, it took me 10 years to formulate this project. And when the Brexit uh, referendum came, or came about, I thought it was the right time to actually take this slogan from the wall and, and use it as a catalyst and walk from my home in Cardiff. And, and where was this exactly? Where did you, exactly did you see this written? Uh, just, just, just around the corner here for a liver in Cardiff. So around the corner the from where you live, it said, yeah. Polish, go home. Yes, yeah. I don't think it was meant for me because it was, I was like, you know, far away, but it, it doesn't matter, you know. It's just a language of general abuse uh, directed at anybody, so I, I, I felt it was uh, something that must be addressed in many ways, because um, addressed? it did affect me. Yes. I mean, appropriated in many ways, you know. It's, after all, when I saw it, I am Polish, I'm British at the same time, but uh, when you read something like this, it's very impossible for me not to react to it personally, even though I have, I don't live in Poland and I, I shouldn't be really, um, you know, getting upset about this, but you do. I mean, I did anyway. And I wanted to find out what it meant if I was at home or if anybody could tell me whether I was at home or if I should figure this out for myself. And I thought the only way to find out is to actually walk from this home to the other home and ask every single person I meet in these eight countries I would cross, where is home? <laughs> what does it mean? And then I was hoping that at the end of the journey, I would actually understand my position in, in Britain, in Europe, in, in, in the world a bit better. And that was, that was the premise. Right. Well, I'm going to ask you at the end of our little Q&A here whether or not you succeeded in achieving that. But before I do that, I, because I think about home all the time because I'm an expat as well. I've lived here in Europe for nearly three decades. And, uh, and I think we even talked about this a little bit as, am I American or am I Dutch at this point or European? And I said, well, a little bit of both, but also kind of neither. Yeah. They have this uh, really good word for it in Dutch, uh, untheimd, which means not having a sense of home. How do you feel? Uh, I don't need to be validated by administration, by a country, by a passport or government. That's how I feel. I feel very much at home having ground under my foot. It's a very basic human thing that we are born onto this piece of rock that's spinning through space exactly the same way. We're going to die exactly the same way. Which way whichever way you look at it, we, we're heading the same direction. <laughs> so, uh, so in that sense, I am at home no matter where I am and nobody can, can define it for me. It's, it's almost like... It's nobody's business to even define home for anybody apart right. from the, their own. And we own the same thing, the same common denominator. So that's something, that's how I feel about this. And I think it's it's wonderful feeling that you take with you no matter where you go. How, you know? how long, exactly how long did the trip take, can I ask? It's 105 days altogether. And, and along the way, because that's, that's a good long time to be on the road, walking, walking, yes. walking. Um, I'm sure that you heard a lot of stories. You took a lot of pictures along the way. Here's some of them. Uh, that we're showing. Um, what is the one story while you were on the road that really stuck with you? I would say the pivotal moment was actually bang in the middle, uh, just past Cologne. I met uh, this journalist who told me a story of her mother and a house, that, a village that got submerged in a lake when a, when a dam was built just after the war. So the whole, the whole village became Atlantis. And she was just a little girl when it happened. And uh, some 60 years later, she returned to that lake. Uh, and, you know, there's just water, but she could pin pinpoint exactly where the house was, where the church was, where the mill was. And she could map out the whole village that's not, non-existent anymore. And her daughter went swimming and she, she floated above this house that mother pointed to. And she said she felt this incredible connection 
to something that is profound, you know, something you cannot see, you cannot enter. But she felt, she felt like there was a home, her mother's home. But that feeling then, I thought, was just the best way to describe what home is, because you cannot really touch it. You cannot really enter it or describe it. It is uh, everything and nothing. Hmm. And that, that story really, really stuck with me. And that, that footage we saw is actually from that very lake, because I managed to find it and I managed to float in it as well. So that was my little baptism, you know. Uh. Yeah, it did sort of have an element of baptism, the way that you sort of slowly inserted yourself into the lake. It was quite beautiful. I mean, your photos were also uh, exhibited uh, outdoors, intentionally, yes. right? And then you put this up, Polish, you know, go home Polish. That was also exhibited on a big sort of billboard. There it is. And then as you can see here, uh, uh, somebody graffitied right on top of it in Dutch, which means welcome Poles. That's how it's translated. Yay! <laughs> Obviously, I, I liked I, it. I, I don't think I could ask for a better uh, response to a piece of work. I, this is the, you know, like in, in mathematics, minus and minus give plus. So it's like one one vandal and another vandal. And I praise the person who did this. I think it's just. Uh, I mean, if I die now, I'm, I'm happy to just <laughs> have seen this. <laughs> it's one marvelous. marvelous. Nice. <laughs> That's great. So uh, after your walkabout, how do you feel? Are we all brothers? Or are we brothers like Cain and Abel? To extend your biblical metaphor. I mean, uh, I don't think we can, we can generalize. Oh, unfortunately, the world is so plural and so complicated. Uh, fundamentally, we are, we are part of nature. And in nature, you've got some ants fight with some other ants. Some ants build super colonies, like you know the European colony. And like ant hills with multiple queens managed to actually collaborate with other ant hills and they work together and they share food and share resources and they can rule the whole forest. But there's uh, another ant hill a kilometer away from exactly the same species that has just got one queen and they're very aggressive and they do not accept anybody else, even from the same species. So humans as part of nature, we, we are equally beautiful and ugly. And I think it's a question personally, you ask yourself whether you see people as brothers or maybe you see them as enemies you know but right. uh, I choose to believe that people are fundamentally good because otherwise uh, there's no point in carry on on this planet you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and so that's my spe mantra. speaking of the the one queen by the way we have a uh, small video fragment of you arriving home and you have a lovely mother she's the queen bardzo jestem dumna bardzo wszyscy pytają jego znajomi kogo spotkam Znajome moje pracownice jeszcze z innych prac, gdzie kiedyś pracowałam, no z podziwem każdy. There it is. So I'm actually in my bird town, very close now. And then you just go to the forest and you're there. It's amazing. A gdzie jest to? Żeby nie, aż mam motyle w brzuchu. Idzie, faktycznie idzie. Nie widzę. O, idzie, idzie. Teraz widzę. At the, at the very end there, I have to point out that word Simru over there at the very end, that's how you say whales in Welsh. Camry, yes, that's the one, exactly. I didn't realize that you and I had exactly the same mother, so we must be brothers. We are, I like that. She's a universal mother. <laughs> My mother also wears that thing. Anyway, <laughs> that's fantastic. And you have pierogies at the end. That's fantastic. Oh, it's wonderful. What a great video. That's a, just to give a little hand for that extraordinary... 
like uh, really, really amazing. Um, speaking of us all being brothers, uh, Rob and the Cain and Abel type, um, uh, I looked through your earlier work, Sochi, uh, a Russian city on Europe's edge. Where is Sochi on this map? You want to just point to it? Yes, it's on the left side here. You see it, and this small little Sochi region here, the Olympic right. Games took place. Can right. I continue? And then here you have the border with Abkhazia. That's a breakaway republic from Georgia, Georgia. so it's not Russia anymore. And actually, the the, the mountain resorts or the ski uh, events took place here on the top of this hill. And if you took the wrong hill, then you ended up in the North Caucasus, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can continue. Right. Explaining the region. It's yeah. not that big, but uh, you can take a car ride here. You have to go around it one day and you're there somewhere in Dagestan. Now, of course, uh, I know it and I think most people who aren't Russian or from the Caucasus regions know the area because of the Olympics. Of right? Of course, yeah. yeah Why yeah. did you choose to, to work there? Uh, partly because of the Olympics. I mean, that's a fantastic reason to work there because uh, having the Olympics in your country means that you want to showcase your country. There's no other reason to organize Olympics because it only costs shitloads of money. So the reason to, to, to organize these kind of events, also uh, the world uh, football, FIFA, whatever, is of course to showcase that you are the richest and the most fantastic country in the world. And that also allows or should allow journalists and photographers to work over there and to show actually, or to question at least, whether it is one of the best countries in the world. Uh, so that's also the reason why we started working over there. Besides the fact that we already worked in the Caucasus before they even announced the Olympic Winter Games. So for us it was yeah, a fantastic reason to continue working over there. Is this, so is this Sochi? Uh, yeah, 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 this yeah. typical Sochi. Yeah, in a, in a, let's say, in the most positive way. Yeah, high-rise buildings, <laughs> kind of uh, modern with nice lightning, and uh, I think they will be proud on this picture as well. Right. right. But is that really? That's not the only reason why you wanted to work in Sochi. It's because Sochi is look at this sort of little paradise. Mm -hmm. I think that's the point you're trying to make. It seems like paradise. Mm -hmm. Sochi, in the most positive way, is located in an area part of the world that is the the very edge of Europe, and even though it seems tranquil and lovely and they've spent way too much money on building it mm -hmm. uh, and it was and I don't think you mentioned this specifically but I you know we all know it was Putin's pet project and he pocketed a lot of money mm -hmm. from building all things there but it's right next to an area which is nothing like this uh, no it's uh, next to the North Caucasus which is the most violent and uh, most uh, Poverished, uh, poverished region in the north, uh, in uh, in Russia. Right. Who's this gentleman? Uh, and this is in uh, Abkhazia, and so that's the breakaway republic from right. Georgia. And of course, I mean, uh, 30 years ago, it was all one country over there, and Sochi was the pearl of the Soviet Union. So it was a subtropical part of the Soviet Union, and if you got the opportunity to go there. Usually you needed a Puchovka from your uh, employer uh, to go there and then you could take a holiday in Sochi. That was like the dream of almost all the Soviet uh, citizens. But why, why were you reporting in this area? Why, what was interesting for you? Because there are so many, I mean, it's an area full of contrasts. And of course we knew, I mean, we were hoping when Putin announced the games, or won the bid actually to, to organize these games, we were hoping together with Putin that it would increase uh, democracy, uh, that, that it would uh, uh, take away the, 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 the violence a little bit from the North Caucasus, which is almost impossible. Uh, and so it would improve at least over there. So that's also the reason why we started working over there, because it's a region so full with history and, and stories that it's no problem to work there your whole lifetime. I mean, that's, that's for sure. But this, of course, this was kind of chance to see if it would change. And that's, that's why we started working there five years before the Olympic Games. When we, when we were talking five years before the Olympic Games with people and said, okay, we're making a story in, uh, about a region around Sochi, nobody knew what Sochi was. Nobody heard, ever heard about Sochi. And they thought it was a place in Japan, Sochi. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's that's how yeah. Sochi was on the map in 2009. And only in 2040 people started realizing, oh, actually there's a place in Russia. But we worked there already for five years and were, at that point, kicked out and couldn't return anymore. Well, so. let's talk about that in a minute. But what kept you working there? Because you talked about that you started before five years before this all yeah. happened, but you stayed. You kept reporting on this area. Mm -hmm. Why? 
well, simply because there are too many stories to tell. So at a certain point, we divided it into three regions, Abkhazia, next to the Olympic Winter Games, actually. If you were standing on the top of the main building of the Olympic Winter Games, you saw the border with Abkhazia, which was, of course, completely closed during the Olympic Winter Games to prevent journalists from regular newspapers and magazines to go there during the Olympic Winter Games, because that would be a shame, of course. So they closed down that border. Same, actually, with the North Caucasus. No journalist could enter the North Caucasus six months already before the Olympic Games started. So there was a good reason, actually, to start uh, five years before the Olympic Winter Games, because then we could still make these kind of stories about about violence, about trying to understand why it is actually You, you had so a freer hand, as it were. Slightly freer, yeah. We had some people uh, trying to prevent, of course, that we yeah. were working there. But uh, no, we, we, we could make these stories. And when the games uh, uh, took place, there were only two people who actually had these stories around the region, uh, of the region around the Olympic Winter Games. Um, and that's because everything was closed at that moment. No right. journalist could uh, could do their actual actual work in. And what really because frustrated they, they me wanted to control the narrative, of course, it was all positive. The Olympics. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the kind of stories you got during the Olympic Winter Games, and that really frustrated me. Was, for example, of a broken toilet uh, in the in the changing rooms or whatever, and they were making uh, fun of it. Those kind of stories. Well, and that oh, was, ha, it was ha, well it's Russia at again. That moment that they built it all so quickly and so badly yeah, that uh, nothing was working in the Olympic Village, right? Yeah, uh, yeah well, it's right, still so, standing yeah, over yeah. there, so uh, <laughs> it wasn't that bad. But well. uh, but I think it was. Yeah. Well, can I ask you about one? picture in particular could mm -hmm. you guys go back to the boy in the bathtub yeah. I just it's such a look at this picture so is he being dissolved in a bath of acid what the heck is going on here <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this is typical the, the historical Sochi. So Sochi is, in a, is, a, is a cure ort, a spa resort, a spa, right. yeah, a spa, a spa. resort, uh, and uh, with many sanatoriums. And, and this is in Matsesta. That's a place where they have this sulfide water, so the stinking egg water, sulfur, sulfur, sulfur yeah, water. Right, okay, right, okay. Right, yeah. And uh, and they believe it's uh, healing for your whatever, actually for everything. So and this boy had burns on his feet, and he oh, had to wow. take place three times. A day in this bath to uh, cure him, uh, which he uh, which he bravely did, and uh, he was sitting over there. Yeah, I he mean, looks you really happy to be there, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Is it, yeah, yeah. You can wonder whether that, that's my way of photographing him, or maybe maybe he also smiled. Yeah, it's a, it's know, it's pretty extraordinary. Um, you got kicked out. What happened? Uh, that's a complicated question. Uh, I don't know, actually. Uh, well, we've done th some things, of course, but uh, uh, in general, you can say uh, it's very difficult to work in the North Caucasus for journalists, for correspondents. If you are a correspondent in Russia, you go to the North Caucasus and you report about the things going on over there, then you get an, uh, an, uh, uh, a visit from the FSB, Security Service, the FSB Secret is Service. The new internal Secret Service. Yes, right? yes, yes. And yeah. uh, they will tell you, like, if you want to stay here in your nice luxury flat from the New York Times or whatsoever, then it's better not to report on the North Caucasus anymore. So, correspondents are also very uh, reluctant to go to the North Caucasus, should be a good reason. National journalists are being threatened all the time, yeah. and we are no official correspondent in the sense we don't have a flat in Moscow, we, we don't have a luxury uh, thing over there, so we're not dependent on Russia, and also they can, th of course, threaten us as well, but in the end, what will they do? So we've been working there for a while, until the moment that we got arrested multiple times uh, after each other, and yeah, there was uh, apparently a black cross. Uh, are, in our, are you allowed in to go back? I don't think so, no. Have you, you haven't even tried? Uh, no. What do I mean you haven't even tried? Of course you haven't tried, right? No, but the Wait, thing is... Do you have to get a visa? Do you have to get a visa to do that? Yeah, 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 no. Have you, have you tried to get a visa? Well, nobody gets off this list as long as we, Europeans, start putting more people on the blacklist as well, right. businessmen and those kind of people. So I don't make any chance as long as Putin is in power in Russia. Which is a shame because, I mean, I don't have the feeling I did anything wrong and I love the place and I would love to go back. So, Mr. Putin, just allow me in. Can I, it's a serious question because, um, I mean, you put your heart, your soul, years of sweat, uh, your creativity into all of this, right? Uh, and then you have to put up with things like this. Is it worth it, though? Uh, I think it's worth, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, 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 uh, as far as 
uh, as it's possible, I'm proud of the stories that we made, and I'm proud that we uh, reached an audience and told these kind of stories, and I'm pretty sure that the Russians, or at least the Putin-minded Russians, that they don't like these kind of stories. But I think it's also important to tell these kind of stories. So, uh, especially, I mean, imagine that during the Olympic Winter Games, we had our, our at that moment, Crown Prince, uh, our current king, Willem Alexander was shaking hands with Vladimir Putin, who was responsible for the human rights violations that we were t describing in the North Caucasus. I mean, very severe human rights violations. And our king, I mean, I'm super ashamed for these kind of moments. And then I think it's important that we journalists, photographers, tell these stories to a larger audience that also a larger audience becomes ashamed for our king being there and shaking hands of Putin. I mean, how crazy are you? There are many political leaders who avoid going to, to Russia. And what do the fucking Dutch king do? That's unbelievable. So yes, it's worth it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought you were saying. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. The answer was too long. The gentlemen are sort of, <laughs> our guests are also sort of clapping uh, behind you there. You can't see them, but they're nodding their no, head and yeah, clapping. Okay. So you Sorry. have support yeah. from the room. You have support from the other guests. Okay. Um, now, Willem Alexander. I think actually this is a very opportune moment to bring in, well, to talk about the fourth guest who was supposed to be here, uh, the uh, American photographer Todd Darling, and he lives and works in... Hong Kong, and he is also exhibiting here at Beta Photo 2. So let's watch a video that shows what he created in Hong Kong in the past year. That's uh, that's some pretty hard hitting stuff. And I mean, if 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 Todd were here, I think the first question I would probably ask him would be, uh, did you get hurt making these? Because there was, you know he was right in the middle of things. Uh, they were quite serious. And I, I personally asked to have this picture uh, put up because uh, I saw this picture. Is the uh, gentleman in this picture? His name is Joshua Wong. Todd took this picture. He's uh, an activist and a politician. And the uh, the Chinese text on it says. Uh, once Beijing, oh here it is, yeah, once Beijing promised Hong Kong one country, two systems, but it has become one country, 1.5 systems now. Under Xi Jinping's rule, our freedom has been eroding. But we will never give up because Hong Kong is our home. We deserve democracy and freedom. No one should have to flee their home out of fear. And Todd actually wanted to be with us today, but unfortunately he could not attend. Uh, but he did write a very long missive about the situation in Hong Kong. Here's just a little bit of it. I'm not going to read the whole thing. He wrote, the new security law seems to be having the desired effect on dissenting views in society. There's a lot of concern about what constitutes a violation of the new law. So the result is people self-censor or modify their views in public in an attempt to stay within the bounds of the law. Unfortunately, Hong Kong society remains divided without a clear path of reconciliation. As an American and a Hong Konger for 20 years, I will decide where is best to raise my children that provides us with the most security and the best opportunity to teach them the values I hold dear. And for now, it's in Hong Kong. I have to say, not the answer I was expecting, but there you have it. That's what he said. So today's show, uh, and this is to all three of you, gentlemen, it's about the intersection of art, photography, and politics. So what do you guys make of that? Starting with you, Rob, what do you think about what uh, Todd wrote there? Yeah, well, in general, what I hear, what I uh, understand is that he feels pressure to work over there and, uh, um, 
and, and that's of course a big problem. Um, and also I hear this thing about self-censorship, which is a very smart strategy from, let's say, smart regimes uh, to, to do basically and to achieve what they actually want to achieve. And they will achieve it over there. I mean, it's very sad, but I'm not very When positive. you say they, you mean the Chinese government? Yes, yeah. yes. I'm not very positive about it because the international community doesn't do shit. And that's the same over here. It's the same in Ukraine. It's the same in, in, in all these kind of places. Uh, nobody wants to burn their hands because of international uh, trade and economy and those kind of things. Uh, so I'm not very positive about what will happen over there. And uh, I can understand that he does feel safe. And that's sad. Right. What do you think, Ed? Let's bring you in on this. Well, I mean, I think it reflects, well, first of all, the um, sort of intrepid, uh, uh, committed nature of not just his Todd's work, but you know many photographers and filmmakers and journalists who are trying to work in in what is becoming fast become a very hostile environment for uh, fact and truth seekers. And uh, you know I agree with Rob. I think you know the Chinese have been masterful in basically getting all of us ad addicted or um, uh, hooked to their to commerce with them, and and then <clears throat> all the leaders of the world are afraid to push against that. You know, what is Apple going to do? What are so many companies, so many countries going to do who are now in some ways dependent or so in bed with the Chinese, at least on, on the business level at the very least. And so um, it's, a, it's a sad situation. But again, alas, we are experiencing this in so many places around the world now, including in the United States, which I just cannot believe that it's come to that. So, you know, I feel like the work of, of Todd and, 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 and many folks who are working in these kinds of environments is, is so critical. And, um, you know, we, we need to find ways to protect these, these people so that at least we can get some information that, um, you know, that is uh, valid out of these places that are becoming dark. And what about you, Michal? You, you, do you have anything to add to this? I would say it's, it's actually, uh, I mean, it's always hopeful to see work uh, like, like Todd's come out and be presented to, to us, you know, to the community in, in Europe, for example. Like, I, I empathize greatly because I come from a, a, a social, my, my past is, you know, Soviet Union grip, like for the first uh, 15 years of my life. So I understand what it means to be self-censored or government-censored or to be living among people who watch is vigilant against one another so uh, to have seen the other side and to now have this privilege to be deliberating where my home is and if i were to raise children or to live i have the choice so i can uh, it's 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 actually it's it's heartbreaking to know that this is a never-ending struggle in different parts of the world like you know systems just kept keep repeating uh the same kind of patterns and then um i only hope that you know the the, the progress is quicker than the, for, for, for Hong Kong than, than, than it was for Poland, for example. You know? Right. Well, you know what? We're, we're, we're rounding this whole conversation off right now. We don't have a whole lot of time left, but I do want to leave on a positive note. So let me just give you one last question, one more round through the guys, starting with you, Rob, and that is cons you're, you're all very well-traveled uh, people. You've seen a lot of the world. Some of you report on the world for decades and decades. Um, and for the most part, we, we, a lot of the things that have been presented and that we've talked about today have been fairly pessimistic. What's the one thing, Rob, Ed, Michal, what's the one thing that gives you hope? For, for me, I think actually that if we, if we really look to our profession, uh, the thing that gives me hope is that I think there's a lot of potential uh, in really making impact. Uh, and we are too shy still in, in what we do. Uh, and we depend too much on, on the traditional channels and the traditional, traditional ways of disseminating our work. But I think actually that, that people like Todd or whoever who are having an important story to tell uh, can make impact if they find the right distribution channels to, to bring their stories into the world. And sometimes you have to do that all yourself. And I have one example which I still find totally great, and it's a very old one, and that's David, David Douglas Duncan, uh, I Protest, a book he made after the war in Vietnam. It was a very small pocketbook that he sold for, I think, one dollar, and he printed something like 100,000 copies in America. I'm pretty sure that Ed must know the details. He did, he was nodding his head. Yeah, and I think it's <laughs> so fantastic that you don't 
make work to, to sell to New York Times or whatsoever, which he probably also did, but you do it because you think you have to make a change and then you print the book and not in an edition of 250 copies like we do nowadays, but in an edition of 100,000 copies and you sell it on the street and it's going to make a change. And that's why I'm very positive about this profession because I really see hope for all of us if we focus a little bit more on making impact instead of only making stories. So I'm actually quite positive. Excellent answer. Ed, same question to you. Yeah, I, mean, I think what I find, uh, where I find hope, if you like, well, first of all, I think there's such a damn disconnect between the majority of people in this world and how they feel and what they believe and what, what through social media and the manipulation of politics in the media, you know, we're led to believe. I hope that made sense. But that the truth is what I see in my travels, both throughout the United States and, and around the world, is that there is, especially this new generation, we are so, we are on the precipice of like tremendous progressive change, you know, and, and it feels like so many elements are, are lined up for it to happen. But there are these mostly old white men who are in power and uh, you know, Trump being the most egregious example in, in the democratic world, Putin, and others that that you know have long you know behaved the way they're behaving. But that if somehow we can break through this stranglehold of what I basically I believe that the extremist voices are controlling the debate, but they don't represent how the majority of people actually feel and what they think. And, and your work can contribute to this? Because it's really also about the work we're talking about. Just super briefly, tell me how you feel like the word can contribute to this. You're asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, <laughs> like, okay, no, I wasn't sure, you know. No, it's I wasn't definitely sure you, Ed, you. <laughs> well, I'll put it to you this way. As a, as a father of 22 and 25 year old kids, uh, um, what I've watched in their evolution and their sort of political evolution and awareness is that social media in particular, and like picking up on what Rob just said, while you know absolutely doing like physical printout of 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 of, um, of work is super important. We have this other these other channels to reach people in a way that we never could. And I think with when you take everything into account the kind of reporting that's being done, the stories that are being told. There's a whole new generation besides folks like myself that are out there trying to do these to, to do these stories. That when you take all of this together, I think there's tremendous opportunity for positive change, for progressive movements to happen. But we've got to break through this period right now. We've got to clear some daylight, if you like, for these new voices and these, these, these very real sentiments to, to reach fruition. Right. And finally, to you, Michal, very quickly, though, because these old white men, we've eaten up all your time. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> I would say my hope lies in the, in the cyclical kind of uh, nature of the universe. You know, it's like, if I look at this globally from, from the bigger perspective, things work in cycles. And we are, the amplitude is very low at the moment, and you can see it in, in, in the individuals and in groups and in, in governments across the world. So my hope is that this trough is going to have a peak and it's just a shame that we're riding the low wave of this one because I really, uh, I, I much would have preferred And the kind of thing you do, does it contribute to that? Because it was extremely positive. I, I believe so. I think the global, the personal becomes the global. So, I, I mean, this sounds very hippie and I apologize for this, but, you know, you live the life that you want other people to live. You know, it's like you, you, you say things that you want to hear from other people. Just don't be an asshole. And if everybody had the same kind of approach, you know, we would really get on. It sounds very naive and sweet and <laughs> hippie, but... I try to be that person, and, and you know, that's as, as far as I can push this. So the final takeaway is the quote, of, I think, of the, of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be an asshole. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of another edition of Artist Talk. Let's uh, let's a little round for my guests uh, today. Rob Poinster, right here with me, Ed Kashi, and, of course, Michal Ivanovsky, all uh, with us via Zoom. Um, Thank you, you guys. You were really great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you and uh, next week's Artist Talk is uh, about gender. Uh, and it will be hosted by the journalist Lisa Peters, or Peters, and her guests are Jonas van der Hagen in the studio, and uh, Lawrence Rasti and Soraya Zaman. They will be coming in via Zoom. And uh, you can go to the Breda Photo website uh, for more information. Um, 
I will not see you next week. Lisa Peters will see you next week. But I do want you to have a safe, a wonderful Sunday. Thank you for watching, and goodbye. Thank you. Surumbatico. 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 Okay. Bueno, chao.